uh, Kyle Torno through 2020, uh, my through 2022, uh, and a new associate member named Hillary Mateeve um, was also appointed and um, came in and got sworn in today. Uh, although she won't take official office until the 1st of July, um, does the board have any problems? We have an empty seat. If she comes up and sits through as if she were going to vote. I absolutely do not have a problem. Eric? Hardly encouraged. <laughs> Sounds great to me. Okay. <laughs> Hillary, come on up. Uh, we have actually three cases tonight, um, the first of which is a continuance, <coughs> uh, which is on 357 Main Street, Law 17, Map 17, Law 23, which is uh, better known as Burger King. Um, <coughs> at the last meeting, we had to move three cases. We moved two of the cases to last Wednesday. Two weeks ago Wednesday. No, last Wednesday. Two weeks ago last Wednesday. And one case was moved until this evening, and that was uh, the Burger King uh, sign issue. Uh, we have a letter from them dated the 29th of May. <coughs> uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, please let this letter serve as a request to further postpone this case until the 19th of June, 2019, or a date acceptable to both parties. As you will recall, May 15, 2019, due to an error in posting, uh, it was necessary for the board to postpone the hearing schedule that night. This case was postponed until the 5th, which is this evening. And due to scheduling conflict, the applicants are unable to attend June the 5th. We would like to further postpone until June 19th, to 19th of 2019. Um, and I think we have Three cases that night? Yeah, so Burger King will make four. Um, is, and that is not, we didn't schedule that one at, at all. Uh, it continues to be put four cases on that night. How do you feel about it? <coughs> That's be a little. I haven't looked through the cases. Um, we could either, I mean, I would like to get it out of the way. If, okay. Any problems? We're going to hear it one way or another, right? Yeah. <laughs> it might be a longer night, that's all. Yeah. Okay, so I'll accept the motion to continue the subject matter of case number. Nineteen zero seven. Nineteen seven, which is the um, three fifty seven Main Street, uh, until the nineteenth. So moved. Here, second. Second. Call seconds. On any discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Move to the nineteenth. Uh, that uh, it'll be. The, I don't know where it'll fall, but it'll be on that night. Kristen, will you get in touch with um, Heather from the uh, sign company and let them know that they're on for the 19th? Ask them if they'll be ready to complete it at, at that night, too. Okay. Thank you. We have two cases left before us this evening. Um, First case is uh, case number 1909, 55 Walker's Book Drive. The Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a public hearing in the Selectman's Meeting Room, Town Hall 16 Lowell Street, Reading Mass, on Wednesday, June 5th, 2019, at 7 p.m. 
upon the application of sign design pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 48, Section 10 for variance under the Reading Zoning Bylaws, Section 4.5.2 and 8.6 Table of Signs, as may be determined by the Zoning Board to install a new sign, wall sign, that exceeds allowable installation height on the property located at 55 Walkers Book Drive, Reading, Massachusetts. Um, Who's uh, representing tonight? Uh, do you want to come forward? <coughs> Have a seat in the front. Um, unless there's an objection, I will dispense with the reading of the abutters list, except to say that the abutters were notified as were the following. Board of Selectmen, Police Department, Building Department, Health Department, Engineering Division, Town Clerk, Fire Department, Conservation Commission, Assessor's Office, CPDC, members and associate members of the Board of Appeals, as well as the planning boards of Wakefield, Linfield, North Reading, Stoneham, Woburn, and Wilmington. Testimony given before this board is taken under oath, so if you think you may wish to speak this evening, please stand and, stand and raise your right hand. It doesn't hurt if you want to speak at all, please stand and take the oath. Just, uh, I swear that the testimony given before the board this evening is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the answer is I do. Um, so if you would introduce yourself, and you can start off by telling us what you want to accomplish. So my name is Bob Goober. I'm with Weston and Sampson. We are the current tenant of 55 Walkersburg Road. With, with me is Kim Plord, also Weston and Sampson, and Carolina. Carolina Pedrosa. Pedrosa from Sign Design. Okay. So, um, thanks for seeing us tonight. Um, just to give you a little background on our firm, we're a 120 year old, 100% employee owned firm. We were formerly headquartered in Peabody for the past 30 years. Um, and we moved into Reading in March of 2019, taking up roughly 20, uh, 45,000 square feet. We are the anchor tenant in the building. Um, we've seen ex exponential growth in our organization. We've been fortunate to grow both in growth revenue and in employees. We're up to 600 people now along the Eastern Seaboard, but Reading is our headquarters where roughly 200 people are assigned um, as their home base. When we started searching for space two years ago, uh, we looked at Peabody, Danvers, Byfield, Wakefield, Linfield, and Reading. And we shortlisted to two spaces, 55 Walkersbrook and 7 Edgewater, 700 Edgewater. Both were beautiful Class A spaces. We loved the access from 128, um, but the differentiator for us at 55 Walkersbrook was not only the walkability of that space to all the restaurants and the shopping right at 55 Walkersbrook, as well as the access to the train station and the lake, um, but the really the most important differentiator was we negotiated as part of our lease signage to replace where the Keurig sign had been. So that to us was very important. Um, as a growing organization, we launched a rebrand in 2016, and the way we market to our clients, which are municipalities just like the town of Reading, um, is through name recognition and reputation. So that to us was the selling feature of the 55 Walkersbrook space. Um, when we hired Sign Design to come and help us with that sign, we were surprised, to say the least, that um, it was denied because we, the building had actually been marketed that way to us. The um, owner of the building sent us a picture of the front of the building with our sign on the top of the building. Um, so um, we, we are going to be in Reading for at least 11 years. We've negotiated two five-year term extensions. We've also negotiated to expand space based on availability because we think we're gonna grow even more into that space. Um, and it's really important for our market and our brand to have that visibility from the highway so that our clients who are 200 municipalities in Massachusetts are the majority of our clients, know that we're here and um, see that, that recognition. Um, so we appreciate your consideration. Um, we're not asking for a fancy sign, just our logo in the same place as the Keurig space or the Keurig sign that was there. And um, we appreciate your consideration. We also have some images um, that we'd like to pass around showing the former location of the Keurig sign and then an image showing where we would propose the West Indian Sam Society. So we can see a comparison of what was there and what we're um, requesting tonight. 
Okay, I, I want to hear more about the sign itself, but before we do that, um, um, I want to have uh, Mark, our building commissioner, uh, to um, review his uh, denial, and uh, I know we've done some homework on this. Um, let me send it over there. Okay. Um, uh, Mark? So basically, the, Mr. Chairman, the application was denied based on Zone and Bylaw 8.6 Table of Signs permitted by Zoning District, Note A, where it talks about a set regulations for not exceeding the second floor windowsill height for a wall-mounted sign. And that one, we had, uh, I had done research, I found, um, unfortunately, I found no permits for the Carrick sign that was existing. And uh, this evening, uh, Cy reminded me that the previous owner of the building... One of the previous. I don't know where they fit in the scheme of things. I think they were one of the originals. The, the Analytical Sciences Corporation, TAS. And I'm sure they had a big sign right up in that same corner, bigger than the rig sign. I, but I can't. I've looked all over the place for a picture of it. I can't find it. Okay. <clears throat> but I know they had one. They did have one. Well, the, the issue the issue here tonight is number one. Uh, Mark is the uh, building commissioner and acts the building commissioner. Um, any application before him comes to that entity. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you think I'm wrong, Mark? And we have a couple of attorneys in the room this evening that I can see, maybe more. Um, you are the person that determines what happens with this application as it comes through, which would include the uh, request for the signage. So you have uh, determined that the Board of Appeals uh, is the place for this to be held, uh, and that's why it's basically here this evening. Correct. Okay. So at this point, given that information, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the signage itself. So, I can help them. Um, what would you guys like to know? Uh, the sign is internally lit. We will be putting a timer on the sign as well as a dimmer uh, for the lights. It is LED lit. It is 133.4 square feet. It's going to be attached to a raceway directly to the building. Um, letters are going to be the color of their logo, so it's going to be silver letters. Um, is it silver? Silver. It's silver, and the raceway is going to match the brick colors of the building, the concrete colors of the building. I'm not to intrude. So, did you say the LED lights were backlit? Um, they are backlit, yes. No, sorry, they're face lit. But they're going to face lit, yes, sorry, face lit. But they're going to be um, dimmed with a switch. And they would be on a timer? Yes. <coughs> and are you proposing a time? I didn't see that in the... Well, we only saw that there was, raised, that there was a question raised uh, when we got the minute, um, the meeting minutes for the denial, that there was a question on the lumens. Um, so then... We are proposing to install a dimmer switch as well as a timer on the, on the sign. But we haven't determined what the time factors would be yet. Um, do you guys have a set time that you guys would like to set for the, for the sign? It's usually I mean, as soon as it gets dark, it comes on and then as dawn comes up. Well, we would go through that this evening. Um, you understand that <clears throat> as it stands now, the building commissioner has asked us to make a ruling on this. Um, and because the signage right now, the sign bylaw right now, uh, your sign does not conform to that. So you're asking for a variance. So there are some points in the variance that you must prove, uh, which is in the uh, well, I, I would say proof. You will have to uh, present to the board for their consideration 
um, for that. Are you prepared to do that this evening? Yes. yes. Okay. So item one, uh, describe the circumstances relating to the soil conditions, shape of topography, which especially affect the land or structure. Uh, our response is, uh, we believe that there are no issues related to soil conditions, shape, or topography that affect the structure as it relates to our sign request. With the mature landscaping in the front of the building, the sign is not installed as depicted and the rendering will not be visible. Item two, I just want to pause uh, after each one, but is that okay? No, no, you can go through it. Okay. Uh, number two, describe how the literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning ordinance relating to the circumstances of especially affecting the land destruction question would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner. <clears throat> we are seeking a sign as shown in the rendering to clearly identify our headquarters from Walkersbrook Drive and Route 128. For the last 30 years, our headquarters were located on Centennial Drive in Peabody. We do not use conventional advertising. We rely on name recognition and reputation to secure business. A lower sign than rendered will hinder marketing and revenues may decline. Three, describe how desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. Desirable relief may be granted without steps substantial detriment to the public good by approving a sign as we have proposed with the same dimensions and positioned in the same location as the sign that was previously in place by Couric. The sign will not block other buildings. The buildings faces a parking lot and a water feature. Four, <clears throat> describe how desirable may relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning ordinance of the town of Red. We are surrounded by retail stores, car dealerships, and restaurants. Our location in the industrial zone in proximity to Interstate 95 and 128 will, no, will not nullify or delegate from the intent of the bylaw. We are seeking only one sign, which will replace the current sign that was there for many years. Okay. Would you, one more time, um, go over the first criteria? Did you? Maybe I didn't hear it correctly, but did you say that there are no um, justifications for um, the unique uh, location? I, I can read it again, if that's all the record. Okay. Number one was the uh, shape or topography. Correct. So this was our prepared response. There are no issues related to soil conditions, shape, or topography that affect the structure as it relates to our sign request. With the mature landscaping in the front of the building, the stat sign, if not installed as depicted in the rendering, would not be visible. In other words, there's large um, landscaped trees that will rise above the second ish, second towards the third floor. So the sign were at the, at the location that the bylaw dictates, it wouldn't be visible. So if I hear that correctly, to me, that would mean that there are substantial, um, not soil conditions, but a unique situation um, for the placement of that sign in that location. Yes, yes, yes you could, yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. That's why I just wanted yeah, to... It just wasn't worded. You, you got that in me. You worded it. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the first thing that I'd like to do is to turn it over to the board and uh, ask if they have any questions or comments that they wish to make. Um, I always start on the other side, so this time I'll start with Eric. Well, <clears throat> I think one of the, the hard things that you have to contend with is the performance standards to get variance are far more difficult than a special permit. And I think that you know, the current sign being there previously, I don't know that that would, it might have been allowed under our previous zoning. It doesn't sound like it even had a permit to be there in the first place. And I guess I'll, I'll reserve additional comments, but 
I think the first two prongs of the criteria to get a variance, and you need to, you need to hit all four, are a little tough because I suppose you could just remove the trees. Like if you had to pick between the sign and the trees, you got the trees then, right? Or, well, we couldn't because we don't own the building. Well, maybe you could talk to the, the person that you know, leased it from and said, well, hey, you know, you sold me on this with the signage rights. And so interesting enough, it. the building was owned by Nordblom who marketed it to us. Okay. Once we signed off on our lease and became their anchor tenant, they sold the building. So now Nordblom is our property manager. We asked them to come and help represent us. They would not. Okay. So, and we don't really have access to the new ownership there out of New York. Okay. Well, presumably you have access when you pay the rent. Though. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah. there's at least an ongoing relationship right. there. But I, I realize it's outside of your control. <coughs> and then the other one about how it, a literal enforcement uh, would involve substantial hardship. I mean, if, if your target uh, clients are municipalities, um, I don't, I don't know that you know the sign would necessarily make a huge difference one way or the other. I mean, certainly, would be nice to have, but you could avail yourself to other advertising. And I don't know, I guess I don't know the sight lines off the top of my head here if you could actually see that sign from the highway. But if it's just, you know, the Walker Brook Quarter and you've got, you know, Reading and, and Wakefield and any other it's maybe municipal officers that you're looking to, you know, target that would be driving by. But I think that would be more of like a, a haphazard uh, circumstance of geography, right? You just happen to be in the neighborhood and saw your sign. I don't know that not having it at all or having it, you know, on a lower level would um, be any more or less impactful than you know where you want. I mean, of course, it makes the most sense for it to be there, but of course, we're bumping up against the, the zoning bylaw, which is why we're here right now. So that's all I've got right now, John. Okay. Can I offer a response? Absolutely. Okay. So to your second point, um, when the building was marketed to us, um, the foliage was down. It was the winter time, mm -hmm. and it is that position on the building is clearly visible. To is a very attractive uh, differentiator for us, as Kim mentioned earlier, when we were trying to, you know, it's a very big investment in space. It's our 200 people are there. It's our corporate headquarters. It's a very significant investment for our firm. When we were weighing between the position of the building in Wakefield that was well off the highway and the position here that was marketing us with that sign visible from 128, it was a significant financial factor in the expenses that were paying for that space. Sorry. Just a point of information. Are you going to be the sole occupant of that building? We are not right now. We are the. Will you be? Oh, we, that would be hard to say. We we don't intend to at this point. We have roughly half of the occupiable state space that's not general space. So we have forty-five thousand square feet. We are potentially looking at expanding on the third floor. As of right now. There's common space on the first floor, and we have all the office space. We have the entire second floor, and we have 6,500 square feet on the third floor. Okay. Uh, However, we're locked in for 11 years. We're here for 11 years. Yeah. As Eric was explaining, the, the, the criteria to get a variance are tough. And uh, what I went through them, thought, thought through them, uh, I didn't have any problem with three or four. I think that's pretty to me almost a rubber stamp. Uh, the first one uh, and the second one are very tough. I, it's very hard to build a case for hardship on this one. It really is difficult. But the thing that went through my mind when I was looking at this whole thing is, you know, we talk on this board many times about setting precedent uh, and, a, and a concern about setting precedent for other cases that will come before us. In this case, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm agonizing over the fact that precedent may already have been established, okay? Although Mark mentioned that there's no evidence anywhere that we could find a permit that, uh, or a variance approval that allowed Keary to put a sign up. Correct. Uh, I don't know whether that's the same case situation as far as the Analytical Sciences Corporation was, okay? And that goes way back. I don't know how way back it goes, but I'm going to say it's up into the... Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
But if there was evidence of that one being approved for that, then I would strongly look at this thing from the standpoint of precedent has already been set to put a sign up there. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, to me, the most appropriate place to put what you want to do is where you want to put it. That's, that's the obvious place I think that most companies would want to put that sign. But it could be put other places and still be fairly conspicuous uh, about where it is. It just would look as fitting as it would be where you want to put it. And I'll just reserve further comment okay. on that. Go later. Nick. So I think it's unfortunate um, that it was marketed to you in such a way that it was misleading that you thought you could advertise that. Uh, but I also think it's unfortunate that, you know, when we rule on this, we, we, can't, we can't really take that into account, um, that it was marketed that way. Um, I, like I don't really have a problem with that sign, but um, a variance is a very high bar, as was stated earlier. And I think, you know, I do have a problem with one and two. Um, I, I don't see the, the hardship and I don't see how you create a nexus between the first and second question. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's all I really got to say. Okay, Kyle. Um, <clears throat> given that we don't know when the current sign came up, do we have an idea roughly of how long that sign has been up? And that were there ever any complaints? And does it, as we were noting, set a precedent? We would have to ask uh, Mark when he found out the Kirk sign was I, up. I have no information, just people's recollection. Do we have an idea of how long Keurig has been in that building prior? About 10 years. The, the year that goes through my mind is 2013. About 10 years? I can't prove it. It's been there at least that long. So if I could interrupt the board, I know I, I sort of know where you're heading when we're talking 10 years and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So if that was the case, it would be for that sign only. Yeah. Not That'd to be, have it replaced. That, would be, yeah. that sign would be protected. A future sign would not. In a way, this area is all commercial. There is no residential. And I'm look at our bylaws that we have as setting a certain square footage for the signage. I do pose the question of, as we're stating, a precedent for this area. If we look at Jordan's and Home Depot and the size of the signage they have there, already that identifies them clearly off the highway. And to understand this as a business district, uh, and that the building itself, architecturally, aesthetically, is not hurt by this signage. I don't think the location of the area is hurt by this signage, as proposed. Um, would look to understand from our own side as a community and the board, the appropriateness of this sign given the location and the scale of the building, as well as the fact that it's a business that's benefacting our community. And employment. It's very different than a residential area than all the other street scale appropriate buildings. But clearly, this building is unique within Reading. <coughs> the location is unique within Reading. And so, I posit if we should be looking at it from that distinct precedent of that area. Okay. Uh, that just leaves me. <laughs> um, I think the issue uh, of when the test sign was up there is my time with the board, I don't remember it ever coming before the board. Um, at that time, I think when task took over, um, it was, if not the initial, it was certainly within a reasonable amount of time from the time that the building was built. I'm going to go back and ask somebody who happens to be in the audience this evening under the open portion of the meeting what his recollection is in a minute. But um, my concerns um, are variances are very, very difficult. Um, when 
uh, at least before this board in this particular community it doesn't mean that it's the same every place you go however I think that the board goes to uh, beyond what is normal to find out what is what is appropriate what is not appropriate for the community and if there's a way to work with uh, the applicant we try to do that uh, in this particular situation um, I think the aspect of task being there early on um, has a bearing on this and I would like to look at that as we go down the road um, but I first want to open this up to uh, the open portion of the meeting and take input and ask one individual if he would if he's here this evening and willing to share what he may know on it um, to may give us some information that we don't have this evening uh, I, I would say to, to Mark Mark has only been with us now Sixty Eleven days. Hours. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sixty days yet. Just moving in, so certainly he doesn't know the history, and going back in the records is very difficult. So, um, unless there is a concern from the rest of the board, I would love, like to open the uh, open section of the meeting this evening, um, and I will do that at this point. So, I would first ask Nick if if he would. Uh, like to speak on that issue being a member of CPDC and I know you're not here as a member of as a CPDC member but only as an individual that's correct next um, to 21 South Street <coughs> and I'm a member of the CPDC um, I can give you some institutional history of it but I'm sure Mr. Durez will have more technical uh, information about it but it's unfortunate that they were marketed the property with that criteria because North, North Bloom was before us within the last two years seeking a master science plan. And they were told that it was not allowed. So at least it was the last two years. Uh, yes. And they were specifically told that the sign was not allowed. So unfortunately, you see. Uh, and as far as Weston and Samson's reputation, I mean, their reputation precedes them. I worked for a competitor for 20 years. They're not getting business from their sign. The, across the street, that's a different zoning mechanism, that PUD on the other side, I believe. And that's the issue with this property. It's the zoning is very odd for it. That's probably why they're not allowed to sign. Again, I, I stand with you when, when, this, when you come to zoning for a variance. Um, it's a very high bar. You, you might be better off going to CPDC and seeking you know, amendments to the zoning bylaw. But a lot of you're going to be here for 10 plus years. I don't know that the board is that opposed to anything signs on that building on that side of it. Not very helpful, but I know Mr. Durazzo has the technical information on that. What you might need. Okay. Are there any other individuals in the room this evening who wish to speak on the subject matter? Yes. Uh, Tony Durazzo, 130 John Street. I think I might still be an associate member of the CBDC. They voted on Tuesday night. I don't know what the result was. You are reappointed. Uh, Oh, thank you very much. Um, I can give you a quick little history. When it was owned by Task, there was no sign. My wife worked for Task at the time. I lived at the corner of the nearest residential. I can see the building from my kitchen. Um, it wasn't until Task got bought out by Litton Task that a sign went up. Uh, when Lit moved out, I can't give you dates. If I had to do the research, I probably could. Uh, the Litton sign came down. Keurig moved in, uh, they put up a sign, and when they moved out, which was over two years ago at this point, I want to say, they removed the sign. Uh, I have been uh, vocal in trying to prohibit the sign. Uh, part of it is the, I don't mind a sign per se. My issue is the lighted signs, especially when you get into the winter, when you can actually see it from, and it's lit up, you know, starting at 7, 8 o'clock at night. Uh, but I would like to point out to the board and the applicant that they could have a sign at the top of the building that faced directly towards the highway, not Walker's Walk Drive. That is allowed under the law. So if I could interject, they have to meet like six criteria, which is the 1,800 feet from the center line of the highway. Yeah. So they'd have to prove that 48 feet below. The, sign, the bottom of the sign would have to be 48 feet below the ground below. And I believe the building itself is 65 feet. 
could be. Yeah. I haven't been supplied that information. I'm just saying that there's certain criteria that hasn't been met besides facing the highway. Absolutely correct. <coughs> but I believe that building does meet all it, of the criteria. It, it could, yep. <clears throat> okay. Is there anybody else who wish to speak this evening? Not seeing any. Um, I'll close the open portion of the hearing uh, for now. Um, I'll open it back up to the board and see what their concerns are. I would like to first uh, suggest that there are a couple of options that the applicant has, um, one of which is to move forward and take a vote. A second is to withdraw without prejudice. Um, and a third is to continue the subject matter of the hearing so that um, perhaps the board through its uh, zoning commission, uh, through its uh, building inspector and zoning commissioner and town staff might do a little research on this and find out exactly where we are, where we are at and what the options are. Um, we only have one, is I, as far as I know, uh, we only have one Class A building like this in the community. Um, and the uniqueness of having that structure there is certainly a boon to the community itself. Uh, and with, a, with a, uh, a, a, an entity such as Weston Sampson coming in, it just builds on top of that. Um, I, would, I would not like to see us, if the board agrees, uh, and you wish to move in that direction, look at every possibility before a decision is made. Um, because I think that there is merit, even though the variances are very difficult to meet. Um, it may or may not fly, but um, I don't know if how the rest of the board feels about that. I mean, the applicant already has those three options, can exercise it at any given time. Um, but I think that this needs a little bit more study, to tell you the truth. I would endorse that. I think I'd like to see a little bit more of the history of the site of John and property and how far back it goes and what approvals may or may not have been provided. But Tony makes an interesting commentary as a potential alternative which might merit investigation on the part of the petitioner. And if we could do those two things at the same time, then maybe we're moving down that path. Well, Kyle? In addition, for further investigation and <coughs> presentation, given the issue of lighting being raised through the neighborhood, uh, can your signage manufacturer provide us an example of the type of lighting and illumination this is going to pose from another installation or you know, clarification on the, the wattage and what uh, amount of luminance uh, display is going to be within this LED lit. So unfortunately we can't tell you exactly how many lumens the lighting will uh, project. Mm -hmm. uh, these LED lights, they are specific just for the light, it's for the uh, letters itself. Mm -hmm. So just the, uh, the letters will be lit, they don't project out. Right, it's like um, a channel lettering. Yes, but it's, we it's, can certainly provide an example of a channel letter and uh, light it up over here for you guys to see. Yeah, if you have an example to bring in, as well as do you have another installation someplace, um, another building yeah. possibly? Um, Photographs of that would help. Yeah, absolutely. We can provide that. Um, I don't have it right now. Sure. But sure. we can certainly provide that, absolutely. Uh, I think that, would be yeah, you should, it, that is usually exactly what happens when we, <coughs> when the board, the board is not the, is not the special permit granting authority on that. That's the CPDC on signs. However, the only option you have if you're requesting a sign is the appeal process, and the appeal process is through the ZBA. So usually we get it at, at the other end, but uh, when it comes in, uh, certainly uh, if it hasn't been presented, which I'm sure it has through CPDC, uh, we would like to see that also. Uh, so what Kyle is asking for is something that's normally done. And if we, if we were to move forward on this possibility, um, the more information you can give us, the better off I would think that you are. 
Nick, your thoughts? Um, I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. I, I do, and I'm not sure this, the ZBA granting relief through a variance is the best mechanism to get your sign up there. Um, again, I really don't personally have a problem with the sign. Um, it's just the hardship aspect of this um, to me, and, and it almost seems like if this was integral to your business, you know, every city and town has their own sign view, sign committee, sign standards. That's something that would rise to the level of a hardship if you didn't get relief and get this signage. Uh, it doesn't quite jive with me. Um, so that's why I have a, you know, somewhat of an issue with the first two criteria, the variance criteria. So, um, that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Eric. Do you have anything else to do? So, so we're going to throw it back in your lap. So could I ask a few questions? Mm -hmm. that so we initially came to the town for guidance, and it was recommended that we come to a process that led us to you. Can you clarify if we don't vote tonight and we either table it or whatever the terminology is, is there another mechanism for us to get this approved so we do not have to come before the ZBA? Well, if I understand what you're asking, um, the vehicle that you're in right now is before the board, and that is because the appeals process on signage from the uh, Zoning and Building Commissioner uh, gave you a denial. So your only option, you cannot go back before CPDC because the building inspector said this is this is the method that you follow. This is the pr profile of protocol that you must use. So you're before the board. Now, the options are eventually you could withdraw without prejudice, uh, which just wipes this out and you go back to where you are right now and over time you look at other options. Uh, if, it doesn't sound like you're going to leave town very soon, so I mean that there are certainly other options that you can pursue. Uh, the other option that, that I guess I'm recommending to you is uh, to continue uh, the subject matter of this case so that the staff and the town can look at the background of this because it goes back quite a ways, see what we can find for records, uh, and see what we can dig up. In the meantime, um, certainly more information on the signage. Um, we don't have to do this in a, since the case is open, as long as you give us permission to move beyond uh, the 90-day period, um, but you would just request the continuous to a date certain this evening if that's what you want to do. And I suggest that we have our dates and it doesn't have to be within the next 30 days. It does not have to be within the next 60 days, but certainly don't, we need to have a date certain within that amount of time. Point of clarification. Point of information or clarification, uh, Mr. Chairman. If the applicant were to proceed and be denied, is there a time frame where he could not reappeal? Two years. However, he would have the option in the continuance before the board moves to take a vote to withdraw without prejudice again. So I mean, the options are out there. We're giving you as, as many options as, as I think we can give you, um, especially in a situation like this, because it's affecting the whole community. Uh, another point, I guess a question. I don't know if I heard correctly, because I, I maybe the gentlemen that are on the CP. Um, DC. DC might be able to help. There was a comment made about the other side of the building um, as an option. Is that a me is that a mechanism for this board, or is that a, a process that the building commissioner, if a, if a subsequent proposal were to come forward to place the sign on the other side as opposed to the front, could that be approved by the building inspector under the CPCB, and then be bypassing the need for variance? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to double check the zoning, but I do believe that it could even be approved by the building inspector. Correct. I don't believe that requires a special permit from either ZBA or CBDC. Okay. You'd be, if you'd be meeting the bylaws, Mark would tell you that. 
and whatever the criteria is, if you meet it, you're going to withdraw anyways because you don't have to come before the board. Okay. And lastly, if for some reason there were a vote taken tonight and it were denied, would that deny the future option of a counter proposal, or a second proposal? To put the sign on the other side of the building are you are you only denying the front of the building tonight is that the vote is based on what we proposed for the current position of the sign that's what's advertised okay <laughs> yeah we we appreciate very much the board's insight all the information you provided we certainly appreciate your information i think we'd like to uh, go through a continuance process to allow us to get more information and if you're okay with that, uh, follow through with the building commissioner on some other options, perhaps. Time frame. Um, we're booked up through June, which is not sufficient time for you to do this anyways. Um, July was just the one meeting? Yeah, there's yeah, one 17. spot, July 17th. August 7th is open. Um, August 21st. September 4th. August 7th would give you basically 60 days, plus or minus. Give the staff some sufficient time to look at it. Can you go the, through the steps? Sorry. <laughs> There's one spot on July 17th. August 7th is open. Um, I'm sorry. Yep, August 7th. August 21st, <coughs> September 4th, September 18th. October 2nd. September 4th. I'm going to need your request in writing. Is there for the continuation? For that, or is that just a letter on our letterhead? Email is fine. Email is fine. Can you send that to you, Kristen? So I would, I would take it that you, the applicant is requesting a continuance until the, what was the date again, Chris? September 4th. September 4th, okay. Until September 4th, I'll take a, uh, a motion to continue the subject matter of this hearing until the 4th of September. So, so, so late, motion date. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? None. All in favor? Five zero zero. Um, if should the fourth be insufficient time, and if both parties want to continue, again a separate letter will do that. But we need to get back by the ninety days. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Second hearing this evening. Uh, case number 19 10 120, uh, 168 Walnut Street. 
Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a public hearing in the Stuckman's meeting room at Town Hall, 16 Wall Street, Reading, Mass. On Wednesday, June 5th, 2019 at 7 p.m. on the application of Paul and Donna Sweeney, pursuant to Mass. Laws 48, Section 9, for a special permit under Reading Zoning Bylaw Section 5.3.2 and 5.4.7 to construct a two-story accessory apartment addition with an attached garage to the existing single-family dwelling at the property located at 168 Walnut Street. Um, Assessor's map 4 lot 99 in running mass. Unless there is an object objection, I will dispense with the reading of the abutters. Let's accept to say that the abutters were notified, as were the boards of the select board. Got it wrong the first time. Police department, building department. I got to change that. Health Department, Engineering Division, members and associate members of the Board of Appeals, Town Clerk, Fire Department, Conservation Commission, Assessor's Office, CPDC, members and associate members of the Board of Appeals, as well as the Boards of Wakefield, North Reading, Woburn, Linfield, Stone, and Wilmington. Testimony given before this board is taken on oath, so if you think you may wish to speak, please stand and raise your right hand. I swear that the testimony given before the board this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. <coughs> Brad, you're presenting. Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, you should take it. You sound my sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Brad Layson for the record, and I'm here with uh, Paul Sweeney, who is the, one of the property owners, and Peter Shane Dorsey, who is the architect for the property. Paul and uh, Donna Sweeney have applied to you for a special permit uh, for an accessory apartment for their property at 168 Walnut Street. Uh, you had a fairly, uh, I believe, complete package presented. I'll be referring to that, if I may, during the evening. Uh, the Sweeney's have looked at this property for over 30 years. Uh, the property itself is uh, larger than the lot size required by zoning, it's over 21,000 square feet. The Sweeney's have a son, Brett, who has an unfortunate health condition. Uh, in the package are two letters that were submitted from physicians uh, regarding Brett's condition. I request that I not have to read those into the record, but simply incorporate them by reference, if I may. Uh, and that was a letter from Dr. Watrous, uh, dated April 11th, 2019, and from Dr. Lowry, dated March 30th, 2019. Those letters fairly clearly established uh, Brett's health condition uh, and that he has a, a, a need for uh, accommodating uh, As Paul and Donna age, as parents, uh, they're concerned about a sustained relationship, an arrangement for their son, as well as for themselves. Uh, and so as a consequence, they'd like to establish an accessory apartment. Uh, they'd move into that, uh, live in the second floor. His son would live in the first floor, so he has a, basically uh, an accessible uh, residence. Probably the plans are now that their daughter would move into the main house that's, uh, that's on Walnut Street. Their daughter was married and has a child. Uh, the description of the, the addition is shown in the plans, but it does include a handicapped bathroom and an accessibility arrangement that uh, enables Brett to enter the property, do what he has to do as far as the brake protection, and then enjoy and move around the accommodation. Um, I'm talking about that because that goes to the issue of uh, a need for a waiver uh, that is in the application. Uh, but in any event, first to describe site, uh, drilling height is lower than is required for an maximum height is below 35 feet, it's one and a half stories. Uh, front setback, as you know, it has to be 20 feet, it's 170 feet. The rear the side setback is, uh, is uh, conforming, the rear setback has to be 20 feet, it's 51 feet. The lot coverage, uh, maximum lot coverage is 25%. Uh, it's only 12.3%, and that's all outlined on the plot plan that was submitted with the application. Uh, as to the waiver itself, the bylaw uh, does point out that uh, this board can grant a waiver if we establish that the uh, facilitative access needed for mobility for a disabled person. We hope that you found the letters satisfactory. 
The father's here can give any detailed testimony if you believe you need to hear any more regarding the son's condition and the need to construct a, a dwelling that is accommodating for his particular needs. Uh, you want that request, I'd like to go through the checklist, so to speak, and the zoning bylaw uh, to the various provisions, the performance standards. Uh, it does say one accessory apartment per lot, and there is one. This is connected to the to the dwelling. Uh, the, uh, the size requirement is that we're going to exceed the less of a thousand square feet, or one third the size of the existing dwelling. Uh, that's where the waiver is needed, because uh, the size of the dwelling, uh, you need a waiver of 184 feet to allow the accommodating structure that we requested. Uh, at least one of the owners must reside in the property. You heard earlier, as I said, that the whole family's going to live in the property, so they clear and they own it. So that conformed to that provision. Uh, the uh, appearance of, of a single family dwelling, I think it's very well laid out. Uh, from, from Wall Street, it still very much looks like a single family dwelling. Uh, there's no additional uh, doorway entered, uh, created onto uh, Wall Street. Uh, there's no exterior stairway to a second floor. Uh, and uh, there's, there'll be three, basically three uh, garages on the site, three different accommodations for three cars. Property will be connected to public water and sewer. Uh, the accessory apartment will be occupied by Brett and his two parents, so it will meet the criteria of not more than three people in the uh, accessory apartment. It's not a historic structure. Uh, it is attached or detached. Uh, additional requirements elsewhere in the zone have to be met. Uh, the accessory building is not within the required front yard. The garage that serves the accessory meet, will meet the offset requirements. And then elsewhere in the bylaw, there are other, of course, special permit criteria. I'll go through those very quickly, if I may. Uh, it is a suitable location for this particular use. I'm going through 4451, by the way, in this list. Uh, that uh, it's compatible with existing uses and of course is a residential neighborhood and that's the residential use we're talking about. Uh, we're not because of a nuisance due to air or water pollution, flood noise, it, it certainly meets that criteria. Uh, not being a, a substantial inconvenience or hazard uh, to the neighborhood, it will not. Uh, appropriate facility, uh, it is suitable for the particular purpose for which we're asking for relief. Um, it will not be offensive. Uh, it will, it will, the sign regulation division is not applicable. Uh, it does provide for on-site safe vehicular traffic or flow. Uh, there's no need for any loading areas, so that section is not applicable. It will be tied to town sewer and town uh, refuse pickup, so that section is met. It's not a flood hazard area. Uh, and uh, it will not affect the water quality in the area for the particular use. So I think that those are the criteria. Uh, I do have a couple of additional items I'd like to introduce to the board, if I may. First is a letter from the architect that basically outlines why the design uh, accommodates the need uh, for the... For the Thank you, sir. Did you want In addition, well, we know that um, proceedings before you are, are not a plebiscite. Uh, I think it is important to realize what the neighbors think about this. Um, uh, and basically, I have a series of letters I'd like to produce in support of this from the neighbors. I've also stapled to the front of it a uh, town plan that shows in, uh, I guess that's orange, the property itself, and the yellow shows letters that you have in support from the mothers to the property. I'd like if I could introduce that into the record. Thank you. Thank you. Great one out of the And the last item is simply a memorandum that uh, outlines the uh, presentation made today uh, to the board. And that basically concludes our direct presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And I'm in closing, I just respect the request that the board would 
see it's very appropriate to grant the uh, waiver request and to issue the special permit. And Paul's here can answer any factual questions you may have. Thank you. Um, at this point, um, after your presentation, I'm going to ask the building uh, commissioner, uh, Mark, um, for his letter of denial, uh, an explanation of that to the board before we go into questions and uh, issues that the board may have for you. Mark? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we're aware of now, Attorney Latham uh, presented an application for uh, a new addition to um, have an accessory apartment for the owner's son. Um, it requires a special permit because it is a new addition. So it would be, they'd be in front of the board for the special permit regardless. Um, also in the review of the project, uh, the square, we saw that the square footage appears to be over the lesser of 1,000 square feet or 30% of the gross uh, living area of the existing home and the performance standard we got in driveways. We got in the access driveways. So that's why the applicant is in front of you tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I'll do is uh, move to the opposite end of the board. I'll start off with Kyle this time. Questions or no, I think that it is with merit understanding of the additional square footage for the building. I think overall the presentation of the design is suitable to the site, suitable to the presentation of the seat on the uh, street. Um, it, what was it about? It's 180 square feet, correct? 184 square feet beyond that, we should be allowed to right? If you were just a special question. Well, it's, it's only on that that I would have to weigh consideration again of the bylaws and upholding to that square footage and understanding better the use of the space, the size of the garage, the master bedroom above the garage, uh, certainly the living unit below, I can see the need. Um, I presume that this is within consideration of potential wheelchair access in the future, if not presently. Um, beyond that, I have no, no uh, but to reserve further questioning, but that would be the points that I would be looking at. Do you want to Answer or you we'll just go through it if you think you have a. Uh, if you'd like, uh, I could ask if the, uh, if the architect might give more explanation to the configuration and layout that would probably give more justification to the request for the waiver. The good news is that the way the bylaw is written, it's a waiver, not a variance. So we're not mm -hmm. dealing with the standard that mm -hmm. the last folks are dealing with. It's right. really your discretion. Uh, would you like to hear from the architect describing? Well, I mean, if. if, if uh, Kyle would want to hear a rebuttal. I mean, that's his prerogative. He has the floor right now going through this. If not, we'll just reserve it, and go through the board, and go from there. Um, it might not be bad to hear a little bit. The, the largest area that I have of concern in terms of the additional length of the building is the garage. Uh, and I know that's respect also to the master bedroom, but maybe how that is accessible, who's using that garage. They see there are steps, if I'm not mistaken. It's on a, I'm not sure if it's a higher or a lower level than the addition. Pete, hey, you want to describe the sure. you are looking to get into the accessibility issue? The two car garage in the front is to be used by the main house and mm -hmm. also threats on parents, right? So, so as far as accessibility into this bay, all the guys don't have a diesel. So we, we did hold the front um, so that it looked like a typical single family home with that living space above. If you go to the floor plan, um, you're right, there are steps in here because that stairway that leads up above the garage would be used by Brett's parents, Paul, 
and his wife, uh, Artie, of the occupants, his sister of the main house. Kyle, would, uh, Kyle Brett would come in through uh, this garage, which is on grade to his um, mudroom. Uh, we did slope walkways to the grade. It's very low there. So we're only talking about eight inches, the whole, this whole thing. So we grade, we can get it in the front, back, or through the garage, directly in. Slab up grade uh, to Eugene. And their concern from the very beginning, his parents' concern was that apparently he can have times when he needs assistance, so they want him to be able to come down that stairs and have immediate access to the, to the unit. So that's why it's set up the way it is in that separate set of stairs to have access into the one story area. Also, within that area, making sure that Brett now, as he walks with braces and cane that he, and his uh, guide dog, that he can manipulate the spaces that are in there that they're not too tight. Brett, is there a, is there a uh, visual impairment as well? No, I think it's a stability. Uh, can you clarify the second floor plan? If I'm understanding that the sister or the parents are living upstairs. So yes, if we go to the second floor. Is this the new addition or is not a connection? No, no. The, this, the reason for this master bedroom is to have access to that, uh, to the accessory apartment. And it becomes part of it in square footage. So there's two families living in the addition? Mother, father, and son. Mother, father, and son are living in the addition, and the sister lives in the existing house. Yes, Will. Will. That's correct. With yep. the three, three bedrooms. Yep. Four. And her family. And her family. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. But it, it's really that accessibility from that upper bedroom down. Not that that's the wrong word. It's really their ability to get down to the apartment that's important for them. While they, while they give, I forget his age, uh, 28. 28 year old son, um, you know, uh, separate lifestyle and, and um, they're not right on top of them, but they can be if needed. Privacy, that's the word I was thinking of. Right. So I, I was just wondering if the depth of the garage was such that in order to just consider an understanding of the additional square footage, does the depth of 24 feet for the garage need to be as such? And if you were to shorten that up by four feet, would that then bring down the total square footage? That's, that's what that means. The, the, he's looking here with the 24, but... but yeah, he really passes through. Yeah. And with three being about the average depth for a car. Correct. So it would be difficult. It would not work as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. sure. That's why I wanted to bring that point up. That's where I would see if there was room for reducing the building, but understanding those programmatic elements, see some of the restrictions of the floor plan, and thus the need for the waiver. Um, thank you for that clarification. Okay. Uh, Nick. Um, so I had to read up on the performance standards again, and. Um, in reading through it, I was reading about the purposes of the accessory apartment and the standards, and it's to promote the, uh, the zoning bylaw set forth in section one. And if you read that, it's to promote the health and safety, general welfare of the inhabitants of Reading. Um, so I see this as meeting pretty much all the performance standards, inclusive of K, inclusive of K which makes the accommodation uh, for mobility purposes. So I really didn't have a problem um, with this application and I appreciate all the documentation and testing to particularly performance standard K which makes me feel comfortable in saying that. That's all. Sorry. Well I can certainly understand the situation you're dealing with because I have been prepared to special needs children like this. Is this, is this going to have driveway access to both South Street and Walnut Street? Does it now? Not yet, no. No, it, it goes, I believe, well, I'll bet you add it, it stops right before, doesn't it? The driveway? It, it doesn't it does go not go, South Street. It does not go to South Street. It right. goes into the backyard, but not through. In your thought process in laying out the addition, uh, have you thought in terms of perhaps somewhere in the future your son might, re might require a wheelchair? 
accommodation? Because it looks like the, all, the, all the, the doorways and one roof or the other are like three feet, which is yeah. yes. accessible. We, we, I, we did do that to make yeah. sure that it could work. I agree with what Nick said. I, I think I think you pretty much handled the take care of the meat, specifically meat, all of them except 5473B, and uh, I frankly don't have a problem with granting a waiver on what you want to do here. Eric. Brad, thank you. As always, you have a very thorough uh, and detailed uh, presentation. Uh, you spared one of us from having to go through all the performance standards, having identified them all. In my opinion, uh, I believe you have met all of them, except for the one requiring a waiver. And in my opinion, I think you have an excellent reason for that. I fully support your project. Uh, that brings me to the last individual. Um, the 184 additional square feet that were over the... I didn't hear any problem, John, so you mind if I come forward? Yeah. <laughs> the 184 additional square feet beyond the 33%. Um, is that designated in it? Or it just happens to be laid out that way because of the architecture. He laid out the building, and I thank the building inspector. I went to see him initially. He noted the fact it was excessive to the criteria. We went back, and they tried they reduced the nonconformity, so to speak. So it was more than 184. So they redesigned it as best they could, while still preserving the objective. Uh, so it's a, this is a redesign. So the result is that 184 is above the formula number. It's not a particular area. Now, the other question that I have, the master bedroom on the second floor, that was designed for the parents who are li living in the accessory apartment, That's exactly while right. the daughter and her family are living in the main house. That is correct. Um, to me, that's a little bit more because, in reality, um, in reality, accessory apartment um, for Brett is really the 670 square feet that you have on the first floor. The second floor, um, which actually is above the garage and over the portion of the um, accessory apartment uh, becomes interlinked with how we are defining accessory apartments these days. So that could have been added somewhere else um, on the property and, and the 670 would have been simply compliant with the one-third, uh, actually less than, less than what would be allowable. I think if we moved it and made it as a separate footprint, you're still down to square footage. Um, so it was stacked, so there's an open area on the site, that's why it's a second floor accommodation. And unfortunately, someday, as the parents age, if they have to move on, it may be a caregiver who has to live there. So it's important that it be accessible, uh, which is the way people laid it out. Okay. Um, I have uh, I have one last question, and that is the uh, concern that the building inspector had for the driveway, because in his mind it was non-compliant to the standards. Um, that was Part G. Um, I don't know how you want to address that. <coughs> that was that's not in the waiver aspect of it, but the building, building inspector's only uh, enforcement officer indicated that that was still a concern or question mark. Two driveways on one site, that, that, that issue? Uh, yeah, two, two, two access, two access yeah. points. Uh, I believe that if that requires a special permit or reduction in the board of selectmen. 
and I requested that uh, Euclid's schools are subject as to the connection of the driveway be subject to the Board of Selectmen giving that permission. Two driveways on the same property? Well, it's really two. It's one driveway, it's two curb cuts. I mean, it's, it's through. Oh, it is two curb cuts, yes. Well, the curb cuts being the existing exactly. one along the street, and this new one would be on South Street. I understand that there is not going to be one on South Street. Oh, there is one. Yeah, no, there's one the plant. It shows in the plant. I, I, thought, thought, I thought that that, that indicated the... Um, Well, that's the existing, and South Street would be the shows, new. shows the curb existing at that point. This is the house, this is the yep. existing? Yep. That's in the, in the solid? Yep. Now, e, EOP, what is the EOP? Existing? Edge of pavement, I believe. End of pavement. Edge of. Edge of pavement. Exactly. So the, the speckled area is the new, and that's connected. Okay, because the uh, budding house to the... West has a, has a second driveway to it also. I think they do. They they have a they don't have a cut through. They have two separate driveways, one on South and one on on Walnut. It, it's really one driveway with two curb cuts, so nothing would quibble over. It's the fact that it's got two curb cuts. I would object to that. What's that? I would object to that determination. <laughs> what were you? A continuous driveway with two curb cuts. I would object to that definition. Two driveways. Yeah. Wait, put this in, still see it. Okay. Well, now that that gives us Sorry. another dimension <laughs> of what we're trying to approve this evening. Then. I'm sure. That gives us a different dimension of what we're trying to approve then this evening. Uh, we would be looking at the accessory apartment as one entity. And we've been looking at the second driveway, which is non-conforming to the criteria in, in the terms of the building inspectors. Well, I don't know what, what it, I'm not sure that's a zoning relief that we're asking you to give. It seems to me that that is an issue that we have to go to the Board of Selectmen on. It is true that you could say to us, uh, you know this, but you could say to us, you can't connect to South Street. You could say as a condition of this special permit. But we don't need relief to have those two from you. I believe, unless you disagree, I believe that's an issue that we need a board of selectmen from it then too. Two drivers. Right. So, so as convoluted as always. Yeah, well I have to enforce it, sir. <laughs> so G if you go to the waivers. Special grant, the special grant authority can waive A through J. Driveways happen to fall into G. But it also says that the Board of Selectmen has, if, uh, has to authorize the driveway. So it's saying the Board can waive G, but I don't know if they can waive authorization for the Board of Selectmen. I agree. I agree. Maybe they can grant you if you had already had the authorization. Well, it, it seemed to me that what the board could do is, if they're inclined to do it, is they could give permission subject to permission to grant the board of selectmen. Failing that, then you can't have a connection. That's what we ask them to do tonight. I mean, you know, personally, I think the e easiest thing to do is, is not have the, the curb cut on Salt Street. You have the Walnut Street access that would swing around to that one car garage on the addition. Can I confer with my client from you? <laughs> and we haven't opened it up to the open session of the hearing yet, so. <laughs>
Well, we're going to open it up to the public now anyway, but unless there's other questions or statements from the board, no, at this point, okay? Then uh, uh, I'll open up to public comment at this point. Uh, yes, Paul? Good evening. My name is Paul, <coughs> excuse me, Paul Sweeney. I reside at 168 Walnut Street in Ray. Uh, this project probably started about 10 months ago. <coughs> And uh, throughout the process, I've tried to be extremely transparent to all my neighbors, uh, to Brad and to the architects as well. Uh, I understand the concern about connecting uh, to South Street. Uh, my opinion uh, for the neighborhood, it's the best alternative. And the reason I say that is because uh, my neighbor, Michael Carpenter, who's here, uh, he understands, I, I think I can speak for him directly if I'm wrong, Michael. Uh, Michael understands what we're trying to do and why we're doing it. His only concern is that a group of uh, large, I think they're hemlock trees, that are on Sweeney property, but are on the property, you know, uh, shield the carpenter's yard from, from our yard. Uh, he'd like to leave those intact, and we would too. My concern is if the, if the driveway is not granted on South Street, then we're going to have to pave closer to the tree roots and closer to those trees where over a period of time we could lose them. And as a, a good neighbor of Michael, I don't want that. I know Michael doesn't want that. So that's my concern for wanting to go out to South Street. It would be parallel to Michael's driveway, uh, though he's on Walnut Street, uh, his driveway uh, to his garage is accessed from South Street. So it would probably, it would, it would be parallel basically to, uh, to Michael's driveway. And all the people that I've spoken to in the neighborhood, uh, you have letters there from them and they don't seem to have objection with it. And as Mr. Latham said, if it means going in front of the uh, select board to, uh, to petition for that, I have no problem in, in doing so. Uh, it's, uh, and I guess as Mr. Latham suggested, it would be nice to at least get approval of the addition, less the approval of the connection to South Street, and if it's the selectman's duty, select board's duty to do so, I have no problem asking Brad to present, uh, present the same case to him. Um, any questions of the petitioner? Any other? Yes, I'm sorry. That's right. Uh, just looking for clarification then, is the poles in the road, driveway, is it all asphalt or you're saying that along the property line that's not to be asphalt? I can't read the drawings to know where the designation, if it's all asphalt or we're getting different materials here. I understand it to all be asphalt, is that not correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, that that uh, differentiation uh, by the, uh, the dots is simply trying to show what's new. It's not a different sort of uh, paper. That's just to show. That's all asphalt? Yes, that's correct. So then I'm, I'm uncertain of the, you are creating an impact with that paved surface to the trees in this scenario. Versus if it was gravel and there was, you know, it, I'm trying to understand what the impact is to the trees and how you're dealing with it versus connecting or not connecting. Okay. Uh, if I may respond, the, uh, the driveway as planned to South Street, uh, the tree growth that's out there, if any of you had an opportunity to, to try to buy and look at it, if, if you want, feel free to come out at any time. But many of the trees are dead and rotted, leaning into one another. As far as the diameter of any tree, 
that might be taken for that driveway. Uh, it's probably three inches. It, it's scrub brush, bushes, and uh, that's my opinion. Of course, Michael's, you know, and, and any of the neighbors are welcome to, to give their opinion on it. But uh, it, it's almost like there's an opening just the way uh, tree growth or bushes have occurred over the time that we've been there, that uh, it's almost like there's a, a 10 foot wide open right now. Now whether the driveway is gonna go right there, where that opening is, a little to one side or the other, I'm not sure. In terms of how it connects onto South Street? Correct. So I, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to clarify mm -hmm. the distinction of to go to South Street or not and how that does or does not impact the trees. Okay. It seems like you're um, impacting it one way or the other with this plan, whether you connect to South Street. The trees that, that I'm concerned about. Can you, can you confirm by pointing them out on the map? Because I see two groupings via satellite. There's the trees that I'm concerned about are right along here, along this property line, right here. And what I'm saying is, if we're not allowed access to come out and go out here, which again is parallel to Mr. Carpenter's driveway, then my concern is that we're gonna to have to pave closer to that property line in order to allow Brett access up here and into the and into the garage and that's what I'm trying to stay away from is is damaging or trim having to trim any of those trees along there and smite switches so, just thinking of that if you want to save the trees wouldn't it be best just to have a walkway a path that's paved that's just enough for potential connection walking but not vehicular between the front driveway and a new proposed south street to uh, just ask for a curb cut and not the connection all the way from one to the other and that would then keep yeah just eliminate that just take that out two distinct driveways Correct. This driveway would end here as a driveway. This would end perhaps here, be a separate. Then you'd have two different two driveways. Correct. But not anything from here. Yeah. Yeah. Which would leave that as open surface, which would protect the trees, <coughs> roots, and <coughs> not be an impact to the neighbors' yeah. concerns. Yeah. Uh, and again, my goal is for Brett to be able to drive into his garage. Right and walk through the garage into his mudroom on that first floor. Which he can do off of South Street. Which he could do off of South Street. Excuse me, if I could just sort of cut to the chase on that. Yeah. Regardless if they, if they eliminated the middle section of the proposed driveway and had the Walnut Street driveway and the South Street driveway, we still have the same issue. It, True. Besides the trees being saved, we still have the same issue of the access. Yeah, that's where I'm trying to get clarification. You're talking about concern of the trees. I'm not sure. It seems like you have an impact to the trees one way or the other with your proposed plan. Correct. Okay. Okay, any other questions? No. Do we have someone else in the audience? Uh, Nick Safina, 221 South Street. So I live across South Street from this and sort of kitty corner to it. Um, would it be okay if you put this on the east also? Just point to it. Up here, yeah. uh, first, let me just say I absolutely do not object to the use of the um, accessory apartment for this condition. This is exactly why we wrote it. This is why it's there to help families out. Um, I'm a little surprised Mr. Latham, in his uh, presentation, did not talk about waiver or the variance actually for the second driveway. Uh, and that's really the only thing that I object to here, although. Looking at this plan here, I have no idea how you got one third of the existing house. And that's the existing house, and there's a small garage here, and this is the addition. That's one third. Primarily really calculations, but I wouldn't be opposed to a, a waiver for a minor uh, square footage increase if it really is 184. I don't know how they came to that out. The intent of that bylaw is to keep this looking like a single-family home. And the use of a second driveway would not be that. In fact, this board rejected a second driveway on a similar application right around the corner on, on I guess it's still South Street, I guess, into the wall now. 
What's not shown here is, uh, let's see, here's, here's Michael's driveway immediately right here. This happens to be the narrowest piece of South Street. There's a driveway right across the street, and then Heather Drive right there. So you'd be adding this sort of blind approach, and then there's a, a nasty corner and hill right here. It's just not, from a traffic standpoint, not a very uh, safe place to have that. I don't see this driveway changing at all, regardless of whether you do this. It looks like you have a turning radius there. So there's no change to the profile of this, whether this is connected or not. In fact, you could still have this turnaround piece right here. Pull in, pull out. So really, this, this just does not seem like a good place for a curb cut, and it's not in keeping with the intent of the bylaw, which is to have two driveways. I have a question. Um, this, um, this one that was denied, that was just spoken of, were those driveways, uh, was the petition to put two driveways onto one street? Or yeah, two different or two different streets? No, they were both on the same street, but they were on the opposite end of the property. Uh, for the same situation as an elderly um, parent that needed uh, assistance. But this is, well, this is really not appropriate because the two completely different uh, applications um, and the conditions were a little bit different too. So you can't compare apples and apples. There's, the board has never done that. I don't think the board will ever do that. It is concerned about the, the perception of creating um, issues down the road based upon other decisions that was made. However, uh, each case that comes before the board is unique and by itself, so I'd rather not get into that. Mr. Chairman, if I might, clarification for the square footage. So, subsection B, one third of the gross floor area of the principal single family dwelling on the lot. Definitions, floor area, gross. The sum of the areas on several floors of a building. So it's the first floor, the second floor, and parts of the finished basement. That's where the square footage came from. Is it a finished basement? Not, the, not completely. But, but I didn't, again, no, I'm not no, denying that you didn't do the calculation to see it from that point. No, I know, but I was just trying to explain where we got the numbers from, or where we trying to relate them we got the numbers from. And also they're sort of expanding the original garage too, so that, that the garage, The garages are not, that, that's a completely separate issue. No, We're not but, talking uh, about As far garage. as uh, roadway access, so expanding that garage pushes them towards the adjacent property and pushes that driveway there as well. Now we, sort of the self-imposed of the new design pushes the driveway to the west. But the issue of the garages is not the issue here. We're talking about the accessory part. The garages, in addition to it, is not in the calculation at all. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm not making myself clear. Uh, the argument made by the applicant that the driveway could be starting to infringe on the tree line. But the driveway is where it is because of the design that's being created. Well, everybody has their own take on it, so. Again, I don't, I don't object to the increase in the square footage. It looks like it's um, well done. Uh, it's that second curve, that, that, that second drug. So it's, I think it's not in keeping with the intent of the bottom. Right. Our primary request is that the board approve the plan as it was submitted uh, with the two connections, um, and that it would be appropriate if you so find to say that that ability to connect to South Street is conditional upon the board of selectmen approving. Failing which, then it must be truncated, and it cannot connect the cell through. Uh, that would get everybody, I think, in the right form. It may not be the right decision, but the right form. The alternative would, would be for this board to grant the special permit at the inception and deny the connection to cell street. Those are the two ways I see this board to go if you're going to give us relief. Really uh, our request is that you find it appropriate to allow the connection to go through um, and require, however, that that's conditional upon the selectman approving it, failing which it can't go through. It has to be truncated. Thank you. And now to take issue with you, I'll come right back to you. 
take issue with you right now, Brad. The building commissioner, zoning officer, um, is stating that even if you do not connect to South Street, you have two driveway the driveways there. Is that well? It's we need so, to get so the, def the definition is access. So the original you have access from Walnut, and it's sort of an extension off the existing right. access driveway. So it's sort of a play on words, whether you consider that a, an additional access driveway or not. Forget about South Street. Forget about all that. So you have access off Walnut Street. That's the access driveway. But do you consider this an access driveway to the accessory apartment? That's the question. That's what I'm bringing up. <laughs> so we haven't resolved, the problem is we haven't re really resolved the idea of the two driveways. Even if we're not talking about Sus Street, in terms of the, the zoning officer, uh, his concern is that, in essence, you still have two driveways. I, One is I, for... I heard him say it's a matter for semantics or interpretation. I know. And I would respectfully say that if there's only one connection, there's one driveway. Only one street connection is one driveway. But it has four to the knock. There's a circular driveway on the site. It's one driveway. Well, perhaps another option would be, uh, very simply, uh, is to, um, for the board to consider what has come before it this evening um, and not discuss at all the issue of the secondary driveway um, and its connection potentially to South Street, um, which I think Mark would say that the, the semantics of it was you're giving us access to the accessory apartment. The garage is secondary. Uh, you were talking about the apartment. That's all that is issued here. That's what this whole thing is about. The, the apartment. And if we give you the variance, I'm sorry, the um, waiver on the 999 square feet or the 184 additional square feet is for the apartment. It's got nothing to do with the garage. The garage becomes excess to it. You want to put it on later on? That's fine. I mean, I'm just looking at, at options here, but certainly access to it, um, it can be dealt another way down the line. But the apartment is the, is the sole reason why you're here this evening. It just happens that the architect had proposed three, uh, two garages, three car parking in the garages. The, the extra, the, the one the one car garage now services the, the original home. You're turning that into a two car garage, which is your right. Not gonna have a problem with that. The accessory apartment is, a, is the uh, criteria that we're w working with. The addition to the garage on the other side is in addition, it's accessory, it's, it's attached, but it's still accessory to the issue that we're talking about tonight which is the accessory apartment. That's, I assume that that's your primary goal, the accessory apartment. Because of the, uh, because of Brett's health, he does need a, a garage. So you would need to have permission to the extent it's required from this board to be included in the decision. But if the plan is shown, as to what then happens to connection to South Street, I, I can appreciate that. But we, we really need to have the garage be fait accompli as being approved for its current location. He has to have a garage. He can't. He can't be cleaning his car off outside and so forth. So, there are special circumstances here. Well, not everybody has a garage either. So. I, I, I'm not. I'm not demeaning the fact that the the, the architectural design is for a garage. I understand what that's for. And right now, Brett can drive. Down the road, he may not be able to drive. So it becomes. A question mark. But anyways, I don't know how the board how the board wants to, to move on this. Yes, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, my name is Michael Carpenter. I live at 170 Pearl Network and I live 
174 Walnut Street where the property adjacent to Paul. Um, they have been out neighbors for 30 years. When I saw the drawings, um, one of the questions I had, and Paul and I have spoken about this, is, is it has to do with the driveways. Um, there are eight hemlock trees that, unfortunately, there's not an original plot plan including all of this. But with the single car garage, is uh, you, you, their driveway comes up Walnut Street from Walnut Street, and then they go around the single car garage to get to the back. Um, with the addition of a two car garage, um, if there's any thought of, of driving around that to get to the back, those trees are in danger. Because right now, with the um, one car garage and the driveway beside it, they sort of drive almost under some of the limbs. So Paul and I have spoken about it, and that was my concerns, because that provides us privacy. Because um, our bedroom and porch uh, right about their, their property, and it's with the, uh, the trees, it's nice. So he, um, you know, we talked about it, and you know, I didn't see it in the drawings, and he explained to me that it's something that the Board of Selectmen have to approve as far as the driveways. Um, and my concern is if it's not approved of the driveway on South Street, then we're going to have five cars coming in off of Walnut Street driving around this two-car garage. This is going to have to be a two-car garage put in and a driveway for these cars to go back. And Paul and I have talked about it, and he showed me that's what he didn't want to do. He wanted to protect the trees, too, so that cars could come in from Walnut Street and two or three cars would come in from South Street and the trees would be protected and there'd be no driveway beside the garage. So that's my concern um, about the, the addition. Um, I also have a question about accessory apartments. I don't know if you want to take it now or, or later. You have the floor. My question is, you know, I understand the bylaws and um, you can have no more than three people, and it's family members and all that. But with these accessory apartments that are being built in the town, houses are going to turn over. And when they turn over, what are the zoning uh, bylaws for who can live in that accessory apartment? Can they rent it to anybody? Does it have to be a family member? Can they rent it to anybody they want? Can it be an Airbnb? I'm just thinking down the road, what's going to happen to these? Um, because it doesn't state that I see in the bylaws that it's a requirement that it has to be family members. And well, it absolutely does as part of the regulation requirements that one family member must live in either the existing house or the accessory apartment. It does not specify that you have to have it reserved for all, all family members. Right. So, so if these houses turn over, somebody, obviously the owner is going to live in one of them, probably the primary residence, but they could then rent the, the accessory apartment or it could become any of the MVPs. Not that my understanding? There's nothing to prevent it from happening. No, Correct. well, I mean, there's nothing to prevent it from happening in theory, but legally the new owners have to abide by the same regulations as the previous owners for this uh, um, that got the special permit. They're, they're abide by the same rules and regulations. So the new owners, if they're going to continue that special permit or that accessory permit, they have to follow the same criteria. And the criteria is that... that, that the, the three people, two bedrooms, one. owners have to occupy one or the other? Right. But, but, but again, they could rent out the accessory permit anybody they want, and it could be any Airbnb. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't know that until a point that we got a complaint and we'd act on the complaint. We wouldn't, I mean, it could be happening now that we wouldn't know about. But they're in violation of their special permit and they're in violation of bylaws. So, as the houses turn over, the people that buy the houses, um, I, I still, I'm confused. So, they, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use that word assume. I assume when a new buyer is buying a house, it's probably advertised as having an accessory apartment. They're probably buying as an accessory apartment. The realtor comes in and does the research right. on the property, 
uh, for the new owners, and it's taken from there. Right, but there's nothing from preventing them from renting out the accessory apartment or turning it into a Airbnb. I just, because there's nothing in the bylaws that says that. And I just want to understand. Am I correct? Well, there's nothing to prevent, there's nothing to prevent anybody from doing anything wrong until we find out about it. But I mean, I any, if, I, if, I could just, if I could just read this part, sir. Any special permit issued for an accessory apartment shall be limited to the original applicant, but may be transferred with ownership upon a determination of the building inspector that all the requirements of the zoning bylaw applicable to an accessory apartment are satisfied. So the new owners have to follow the same rules. And if they don't, then there's a violation, and we take it from there once we know about it. OK. OK. So there is a provision in there. Is that what everybody understands? Because I read it and didn't understand that. But so whenever the house turns over, they have to abide by the same. Right. And if, if for some reason we found out they weren't, then we would take action. OK. OK. I mean, I'm not worried about it in this situation. <coughs> so. I don't want to get into that down the line, but I mean, CPDC is, I'm sure, well aware of that and, and looking to maybe look at some of those issues because this is a current, this is constantly going on with the, uh, the, the expectation of the CPDC. They're, they're planning for the, for the community, so that's what, they, that's what they're, they're doing. Okay. So if there's if there's an issue, I mean, certainly people can if they have a concern such as that, go to CPDC and talk about that. Okay. Is that the understanding, Nick? Well, I don't think that you can't put Nick in that situation because he's here as an individual, not as a sure. as CPDC member. Okay. So my concern about the driveway is, you know, uh, I, I I don't want all the five cars coming in through Walnut Street and trying to go around this two-car garage uh, and putting in now a, a driveway to do that. So, you know, when Paul explained to me they could come in from South Street, you know, that seemed like a good alternative. I'm concerned about our privacy. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments um, from the public? Hearing none. Uh, did you want to make the last one last statement, Brad, before we, the board takes it back? Uh, I, I just, if we can participate with the board when it goes through its deliberations, because obviously there are issues here regarding the driveway and the connection on South Street, and we just like to know that the end decision is workable for everybody. Um, and as I say, I, I see different options here, if I could just articulate them. I see that you can approve it as presented. You could approve it and say it can't connect to South Street, no matter what the selectmen say. You say you approve it, but to connect to South Street, you must get the Board of Selectmen approval, failing which it can't connect. Or you can say, if we get it connected, approved by the selectmen, we cannot have the connecting driveway from Walnut Street. There are many variative options, and I think any of those are workable for us, as long as we end up with an accessory apartment, a garage, and a means where Brett can get to his garage and the folks can get to the main house. Thank you. Okay. So at this point, I'll close the subject matter of the public hearing and open it back up to the board. Um, you've heard? Well, Nick, did you have a... Yeah, so I, I see the merits of the driveway on South Street, and I see that's to accommodate Brett, and um, I'm behind that. Um, I don't think we're actually voting, and nor can we vote. That's up to the Board of Selectmen on the curb cut. So. We're going to be voting um, on a plot plan that will become part of the record where, to me, the driveway does truncate at South Street. There's no curb cut there and it's yet to be approved. Um, and I'm, I'm okay with this. And I think, just as one board member, my opinion is to approve it as presented. And not even mention the curb cut, because it's not up to us. I, I don't think it's up to us to... <coughs> To me, if we approve this and the support selectmen say no, it's you have a driveway that truncates and ends at South Street. Sorry? I totally agree with what they just said. Uh, I, we can't approve the curb cut. It's not our says here we can't do it. So, but we can approve the plot plan as it is presented, sans 
the curb cut, subject to the approval of uh, conditions of the approval of the Board of Select. If they approve it, wonderful. If they don't approve it, then you're stuck with access from Walnut Street, whether you like it or not, unless you change something else. It's not okay. But I don't see any problem. I, I think access to South Street makes sense, although it does add to congestion there, potential problems. Uh, and it does make sense, but that's not our prerogative to make that call. We can approve what's there, sounds that access. And uh, I have no problem with the layout as it's presented. Eric. I'm going to do it the next time. Say that one more time. <laughs> so I want to do, I'm behind with Nick and Simon. Oh, okay. I okay. want to do what they want to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Niles. I'm in concurrence with that finding as well. Okay. Um, we have before us uh, one question, Brad. Um, in your proposal, did I miss the fact that you are actually proposing as part of this access onto South Street? Yes. <clears throat> it shows it on the cell street, but the reason I didn't talk about a waiver is it seems to me that's jurisdictional with the Board of Selectors. Yeah, yeah. I think in the narrative and the application I talked about that position. Well, it, the certified plot plan doesn't indicate that. Um, that, that you're looking to um, get a, an extension um, of the driveway opening onto South Street. I, I, I read it as, as showing that, John. I'm sorry. But okay. <laughs> and I, I read the different treatment, the, the speckled nature to try and distinguish by the civil engineer that which doesn't currently exist. Okay. Okay. I mean, there, are, there are options that you can have. I mean, yes. Say the Board of Selectmen approves it. Wonderful. Doesn't that think the consideration you want to think of is cutting out that connection between the front along the property to get you from one to the other? You can access from South Street and you've the rest of the well, property access from Walnut Street. But that's subject to the decision. Well, the other issue here is uh, this is a special permit, and we're giving a waiver for the special permit. Right. If the select board does not okay a second driveway egress onto South Street, um, we just need a modification of that. And if they do, then it's consistent with what was proposed. And I do see the dots on my uh, certified plot plan yeah. going past the end of pavement uh, now. There's all your dots, and there's some more dots here I didn't. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'll take a, uh, I, hear, I hear four people, so I'll take a, a, a <coughs> A motion. Anyone? I can do it. Okay. I move to grant the petitioner Paul J. Sweeney and Donna L. Sweeney a special permit under section 5.3.2 and section 5.4.72 of the zoning bylaw to construct a accessory apartment on a lot at 168 Walnut Street in Reading, Mass. As shown on a certified plot plan. I don't have a friend here. By John D. Sullivan III. By John D. Sullivan III. Uh, of Woburn, Mass. Of Woburn, Mass. Uh, dated? 422. 422. And certified by John D. Sullivan, right? Yep. And certified by John D. Sullivan. Uh, the special permit is subject to the following conditions. The petitioner shall submit it to the building inspector certified plot plan of the proposed construction and proposed foundation plans prior to the issuance of a foundation permit for the work. The petitioner's final construction plans for the new structure shall be submitted to the building inspector along with the as-built foundation plans prior to the issuance of the building permit. And the as-built plan showing the completed construction shall be submitted to the building inspector immediately after the work is completed and prior to the issuance of the occupancy permit. Now, did you want to put in there um, the, the request for a waiver of the 
section B of the, uh, which is the additional 188, 184 square feet. Uh, you want to put that in part like a condition? Or? No, as part of your motion. To so, waiver. Um, you can just say uh, approve the petitioner's request for a special permit, including waiver. So sure, including, including waiver to um, yeah. section one. Yeah. Yes, which is under section uh, A. I mean, uh, 5473. So approving to the waiver under 5.4.73. Right. right. So. And you might want to refer to the architectural drawings to. Yep. Can I do that to you? Yeah. All right. Also, as shown on the architectural drawings uh, prepared by Phoenix Architects of 168 Walnut Street, dated 2-26-19. Uh, sheets one through one through seven. Okay. okay, do we have a second of that motion? Second. Any discussion? Now before we move that, is this consistent with what you're looking for, Brian? Yes, it is. Okay. So um I'll take a vote. All in favor? All opposed? Let's show five zero zero. Um, take the board about 14 days to write up the decision. Let me give you a stamp. Oops, we don't have a stamp. <laughs> Oops. I'll, give you, I'll give you the stamp plans, uh, Brad. Um, um, there is a 20-day waiting period uh, past the write-up uh, that will be certified by the town clerk. Um, Are you looking for a copy of the plan or do you have enough copies? Um, I, there's one in the folder here, so. I'll be used to one in the folder. I wrote on mine, so there you go, clean them. I have to do two. Yep. Tonight. My letters we didn't read in, but we have them here. We will accept them. Will you stamp the uh, site plan? Oh, I'm sorry, extra cost. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and the stamp is so big. That is fine. Okay, I'll do the back. I 
for us tonight. Um, okay, I'm all set. You're definitely all set. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So we have minutes for five dates. Uh, one dash, one dash sixteen, one dash six, sixteen. Everybody get a chance to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. I just see one, one thing on page two. Um, third paragraph from the bottom. Um, I think uh, the next to the last line, the fire department states it needs, or I think is is needs. It needs. It needs, yeah. Um, And um, on page four, um, I said something about certainly say they cannot delay the decision. I'm not sure what who they is, so I can't comment. But and my memory doesn't go that far that they. But that's okay. I didn't see anything else. Yeah, better. Yeah, I have on the first page. Um, I guess it's the third paragraph where it starts with Mr. Heap summarized. Um, it reads on. <clears throat> uh, Mr. asked if an abutter could appeal the board's decision. Uh, should we not have a name there for Mr. <coughs> The last sentence being Mr. Heap stated there were various ways it could yeah. go. Do we know who was speaking in that sentence? It was probably one of the board members because it wasn't open to public discussion. So did you say a board member? I just say a board member. Any others? Seeing none, motion to accept. Move to accept the minutes of January 16th, 2019 Zoning Board of Appeals minutes as modified. And a second? Yes. Eric. All in favor? Right. I so. Next one is uh, 124. <coughs> I didn't see anything. I didn't. 
Ahmed. Motion to accept. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Five zero zero. Next one is uh, 220. No. Yes, it's 220. Yeah, okay. Yeah. No changes. I didn't catch me. Good. Good. Motion to accept. So moved. Nick. Second. 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 Motion. Vote. Five zero zero. Oh, you're getting good question. Um. Now two twenty. I just had one on page two. Three paragraph down. I had uh, just a clarification. Um, uh, I had asked Mr. Regante if he wanted to address the three areas for compact parking spaces, rather than three spaces. Where is that? Did I miss something? It's page two. Was that on? That was the previous one. That was 220, right? That's okay. So next we have 228. Anything from anybody? The only one I have is on page two, uh, yep. second paragraph down. Yeah. Well, so Mr. Redford, Redford said likewise with Mr. Cowan. I guess that means he agreed with me. So I would say Mr. Redford agreed with Mr. Cowan. Okay. Anything else? Not me. Motion to accept. So moved. As modified. Okay. Second. Second. Nick. Yep. All in favor? Five zero zero. Um. <clears throat> now it's three six, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have three six on the water. Anything on three six? Not me. I didn't see anything either. No, that's Anybody not. else? No. Nope. Motion to accept. Eric? Second. Second. Who second? Second. All in favor? Zero, zero. Now four three. I didn't see anything in there either.
Okay. Motion to accept. Yes. Uh, there's one on page two, second to last paragraph. It's minor. Mr. Toronto said he agreed. So on and so forth was choice of the applicant if she wanted an official, not end official document. Okay. Where's your stuff? Uh, at the very bottom, it says uh, oh, the second last okay. wanted yep. an official document. Yep. Anything else? Motion to accept. So corrections. With corrections. Second. What else? Vote. Time And the last one, four seventeen. Uh, on page one, um, second paragraph in the bottom. Um, I think that's uh, the representative of the sign. The sign. Yeah. Unless there's any more working. Anything else? Motion to accept. So moved. Second. Next seconds. Motion to vote. Five zero zero. Okay. Um, is there any other business before the board this evening? I would just want to make a comment that I seem to have confused a few people uh, when I'm leaving this board. Okay. So I just want to officially say that I will be resigning from the board effective. July 1, 2020. So you are staying on? I'll stay around for another year, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anything else before the board? We need to congratulate uh, Hillary. You're welcome. Well, this is your first sit in. <laughs> um, what did you think? Um, Kristen will have to get her a 40A, a 40B, and um, a copy of the zoning bylaws. <coughs> and there'll be a test on this next week. <laughs> All right. uh, anything else for the board this evening? Hearing none, none I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved for right. adjournment. Do we have a second? Second. Second. It looks like you want to stay. All in favor? Aye. Five zero zero. So we adjourned at nine fifteen.